Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the uh, time out of your Sunday morning to talk with us. That that's super cool. I appreciate it. Um, so, firstly, how goes You're all welcome. things? How are you? How are you guys doing in in New Orleans? All things moist right now, or what? Honestly, everything's beautiful. It's been like gorgeous the last couple of days. This like low that you on top of us is not only keeping our weather like just like impeccably nice for early September when it sh- we should be still miserably hot, but it's also like doing its part to protect us from Irma. So, you know, it's it's a good thing. <laughs> Excellent. So um, we're talking um, about in our class about um, interpreting, you know, coastal hazards and how we're planning for these things, etc. So. Um, and we're recording this about a week or so after Harvey had all its uh, initial impacts in Houston, and you mm-hmm. went over to Houston as the uh, as a reporter. Are, are you officially a columnist yet? For I would normally say Times Picayune, but I'm supposed to say NOLA.com yeah. now. And then also, uh, uh, so old old viewers of New Orleans stuff will know Times Picayune. New viewers will know NOLA.com, but. But uh, in, your, in your role as a uh, reporter extraordinaire, uh, a daring journalist, um, you went you went over there for um, to take a look around and wrote some columns. Well, so um, I I am officially a columnist now, but when I was over there, um, it was as a reporter. I ended up writing a column about the experience, but um, all, all 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 of that journalism speak aside, yes, I went. To, <laughs> we 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 got into we got into to Houston. Um, I guess it was, we left on Monday. We actually got in on Tuesday um, after the storm hit Saturday, Sunday. And I don't even remember what the dates are anymore. Right, right. So. That's all good. It's all good. <laughs> and you guys, right? Because you guys evacuated, uh, you and your family live in in the city of New Orleans, but you guys mm-hmm. uh, evacuated to, right, your, your aunts in Houston when Katrina hit in 2005? Yeah, so it was a really weird parallel. Like I was, you know, because it took us two days really to get into Houston. Um, it it was just really bizarre. So because it be, like the the August 29th um, anniversary, which is when Katrina hit, was on the day that I was like tr- like making that final trek into Houston um, to cover Harvey, which was really odd because I, like I you know when we we evacuated for Katrina in 2005, um, Katrina hit on a Monday and we left Sunday morning. Um, and that trip took us about 18 hours and it's typically about a six hour drive from our house. Um, and you know, the, it was just this like bizarre parallel cause it took us like about the same amount of time on day two, um, to get into Houston, uh, this time around. It was, it was, it was pretty weird. It was a weird, it was a weird couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what was, what was your, as, um, someone that has, you know, been there in, in both capacities, both as, as an evacuee and now as a, as an observer, I guess we could say, what, what was, what were the similarities and, and parallels and contrasts and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, when you're there, when you're there as a teenage evacuee, um, I, I, for me, like the thing, you know, I'm, I'm coming at this from like having like been in those shoes. Right. And so what was really odd to me was, um, back then I just didn't want to take charity. I didn't want to have to, cause you didn't, you never saw yourself as being a person that needed to take something because you didn't have the money or you didn't have the clothes or you didn't, you didn't know what your next situation was going to be. And, you know, to walk into a situation in Houston where, um, you know, having to, to watch people stand in a shelter, sleep in a shelter, go to, you know, get clothing and toothbrushes and all of those things. And, you know, we were lucky where we were never in, in that specific position where we were in a shelter because we were able to stay with family. But to see people sort of like have that dazed look on their faces. And I mean, it's like, you know, where where people just don't know what has happened to their lives. You know, it's like it was something that I could absolutely empathize with. And I actually ran into a couple of New Orleanians, um, you know, former New Orleanians at, at one of the Houston shelters who, one of whom was like, I just came here because, you know, I evacuated to Houston and then I, I live here now. So I just, I had to come. I took the day off of work. I had to come and just like give back, you know? And so like that, that, that whole like parallel, just that, that the face that people have in those situations is like the exact same. So weird. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things when, when we see these, um, disasters unfolding from afar, it's easy to say, um, oh, 
whatever, a big storm's coming, and so you guys should get out of the way. And then, of course, the, the news coverage is always on the folks that, that hang out. And I think the initial reaction of many folks is, oh, you, you fool, why, why, didn't you, you, why didn't you get out? And, and that all those things you're talking about are extremely human, right? It's like, oh, I, I want to take care of myself, or I have my pets, they don't take pets at the shelter, or right. a million other things that it's not as if people are... Uh, you know, stupid or, or, or whatever. It's just there's, um, it's, it's, it's hard to envision yourself as being the victim of a disaster, I think, but, and, until it actually happens. Yeah, and I think what's, what's really odd about so um, we actually, I don't know if you've been keeping up with all the pump and drainage issues that we've had in New Orleans. In the last I have several. been. <laughs> the challenges <laughs> during hurricane season. Yeah, it's not the most ideal situation. So August 5th, um, I live in Mid-City in New Orleans, um, which did flood. It got about, I think, I, I didn't live here at that time, so I, I could be misquoting, but I think my particular part of Mid-City got like between six and eight feet of water in Katrina. So context is this is, you know, low area in the floodplain, whatever. Um, so August 5th, we had, you know, this just like ridiculous rainstorm that, you know, was not a tropical depression or a storm or hurricane or anything like that. It's just this really crazy rainstorm. And because of our drainage issues, the city couldn't manage it. So I'm sitting on my front porch watching this water rise and never in my mind did I think I need to leave my house. Like that was never a thought that I had. Cause it was just like, I'm just going to keep sitting here because if the water rises, I need to be able to, you know, like lift my stuff up or like be able to take my dog out. Like there, like it wasn't, it never even crossed my mind to leave. And I didn't think about that until after, you know, but it's like, I could see the parallels with something like Katrina or like Harvey or even like Irma where you're, where it's like, okay, yeah, this could be really bad, but I would rather be here and deal with it than be a couple hundred miles away and have no idea what's going on. Right. Right. And particularly for things like say the Florida Keys or whatever, where there literally is one way in and one way out. It's not as if you can just go, you know, a little off to the side and come out. If you leave, you're you're you're, you're gone. gone for quite some time, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think too, like it's just sort of like this human reaction to be like, I want to have as much control over this situation as possible in a situation where I have no control. And so, you know, you're especially like in, in the Harvey situation. What was um, crazy was you have all these reservoirs filling up that they then have to drain basically into people's neighborhoods in order to to prevent more catastrophic flooding. And so people are standing there like, we don't know how bad it's going to be. So like, am I going to evacuate my house for three inches of water? Probably not. But I would evacuate my house for four feet of water, right? And so it's just like this like varying degrees of how much crap can I deal with? And you just don't know. How about – how was the information in um... – so I mean, so so famously with Katrina, um, the what we then call the Times Picayune, right? Uh, folks, folks stayed. You guys used other printing resources, and you guys actually were printing the paper online, um, but also but also printing the paper um, for folks, and that was a huge thing um, psychologically, I think, for a lot of folks, but also for information. How are mm-hmm. people? How are people getting inform? How did you observe people getting information? With Harvey, was it was it nowhere near as 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 information starved, or what, were people mostly doing social media, or how were people yeah. that were in the shelters or whatever? How are they getting their their info? Yeah. So what was crazy? So that was, I mean, just on on the Katrina note, like that was pretty much when, and I didn't work for the Times Week at the time; I was too young. But um, what was fascinating about it was that was the moment that showed the newsroom how powerful the website can really be because that was how people were accessing information. Right. Um, and so then, you know, they're giving out free newspapers and that kind of thing to wherever people in town could, cause you didn't, you know, we didn't have smartphones back then, which is exactly why Harvey was so fascinatingly different from a news coverage perspective. Um, I do not remember his name, but there was this like Emmy award winning hurricane hunter who was doing a live like periscope video through Twitter, like as Irma or as Harvey rather was making landfall. I think he was in Corpus Christi. Um, and it was the most fascinating footage. He's just sitting there in his car, like on the edge of Texas next to the golf <laughs> and just like filming from his phone. And he had, I mean, at one point, like I saw like 80,000 people watching this video at the same time at like 11 o'clock at night, central time. And I mean, we didn't even have, like, we didn't have anything remotely like that for Katrina. I mean, we're talking about like, after, after Katrina, I connected with my friends on MySpace. Like that was what was available to me. MySpace? MySpace. So, 
Yeah. And so what we're talking about now is the ability for people to immediately see how bad things are. And so people were getting information through Twitter. They were getting information through Facebook live videos. They were able to get all of the like trusted news sources through, through their social. I mean, KHOU, one of the um, TV news stations in Houston, actually flooded as they were still on air. And so they're like, they had to switch over to Facebook Live, I think, for a while before they could figure out like where else they could move all their equipment to, to continue working. But I mean, like they're like doing Facebook Live videos like, hey, guys, like our newsroom is flooding and we actually have to evacuate ourselves. So like, give us a minute. <laughs> um, and that was like completely unprecedented. Like we, you know, if like uh, the the Times Picayune like actually had to evacuate. There's like these famous photos of the of whoever was left in the newsroom getting in in the newspaper delivery trucks, right. just, just like piling into the back and and leaving because because they were you know quickly becoming an island themselves. Um and and you know like so I think our newsroom can empathize, but but to be able to to show people exactly what is happening when, you know, is astonishingly different. The um the levee breaches at the 17th Street Canal. We had two reporters, um, well, I think one of them was an editor at the time, and the other is our art critic, who were just the people that were in the area. They've, they they verified the 17th Street Canal breach by getting on their bikes and literally biking across town and going and looking at it. They didn't know otherwise. Right. Along with, along with this um, different access to news and all this and that comes different senses of, of camaraderie, of, you know, being... Uh, are are we being heard? Are we being totally isolated or whatever? So given how connected folks were in Houston uh, and, and the surrounding areas in Texas that were getting hit by Harvey, did, did what was the mood? Did, did they feel that the country was paying attention to them? Did they feel that people, you know, I mean, again, it, uh, different in Katrina, but, but what did you, what sense did you get when you were there? Yeah. Um, one one note on the previous thing I meant to mention, um, the Houston Chronicle also delivered flats and newspapers to all the shelters that we visited, um, which people were actually like sitting there actively reading and stuff, which was just like, it's a really cool thing to see, you know, like a local newspaper, like think of something like that to make sure that people can get their, get their news. Um, so, and, people, and people actually reading printed newspapers. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I got, I actually got, got the time speaking delivered to my house today. So it still happened. <laughs> um, so per the new, the mood thing, um, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with Haley, my sister, um, about this whole thing. And she, you know, it was, there's just like, sort of like this weird, like anger is not the right word, but almost like a weird, sick kind of jealousy that, I think part of the social media surrounding and social media abilities surrounding Harvey really made everyone able to see what was going on very quickly. And so like, we didn't have that in Katrina. And so we were immediately met with like, Oh, well maybe it's not that bad. Like, you know, there was like that infamous, like sort of slow response to helping people. Um, and, and, you know, trapped on the roofs and whatever in new Orleans. Um, and, and in Houston, I mean, before, that storm even hit, there was already help being sent in, you know, um, we, uh, just regionally, we, we traveled and, um, followed the Cajun Navy for a little bit, which are basically this, you know, grassroots, um, or like organization is kind of a, like use the term loosely to describe right. this. Everybody grab your really... boat and go over there kind of thing. Exactly. It's everybody grab your boat and go over. And, and what they do is they actually use an app that also didn't exist during Katrina. It's called Zello. Um, it's a two way radio app on your phone where if you know the channel code and, and the, um, the password to get in, you can hear it's, it's basically like an old school CB radio, but you're using your phone. Right. Which is what um, we use, which is what we use when we do our work in New Orleans and what a lot of the organizers around the world use when they're doing civil protests and stuff where governments maybe aren't friendly to them. And so it's a very powerful app, really, really, um, useful. Yeah, and so, like, all of these, like, different Cajun Navy, like, there's, like, like I mean, I was on, like, nine or ten different Cajun Navy apps at some point, <laughs> or <laughs> channels at some point, like, just listening to all these different groups, like, organizing ways to come and help people, and, I mean, you know, like, Katrina could absolutely have benefited from the Cajun Navy at the time, and even now with Irma, um, I mean, I read yesterday a report, and, you know, I haven't verified this myself, but that, like, some Cajun Navy organizing folks have already reached out to Senator Marco Rubio to be like, we're on call for Florida. Let us know when we need to come in. Cool. And it, you know, it's just like to, to have that ability to quickly be like, Oh, there's a problem. Let's go fix it is 
totally a different thing in, in this world with social media and the ability to communicate like that. Right. It was a big <clears> – <throat> one of the initial um, outcomes or improvements, like, I, I don't know what the right phrase is, for um, Katrina was uh, FEMA and the Red Cross started doing some – um, you know, quasi Facebook like things that were you could go and register and find out. You know, because because the other thing with Katrina is so many people so quickly. Um, uh, I mean, not not as quickly as we would have liked, but but quickly dispersed across the country, right? And it was like, where did my mom go? Where did whoever go? Right. And so that 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 delay and not knowing if folks were were alive, dead, wounded, or whatever was a huge deal. And so that that time thing seems to have completely crunched down, or. or or, or gotten a lot smaller, at least, um, now. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think just communication companies themselves have also just done, a fi- like, a physically better job at things. After Katrina, if you had a 504 phone number, which is our area code, um, I mean, you were not going to get a voice call through. You could text, which is, like, <laughs> Katrina is when a lot of New Orleanians learned how to text. Because even <laughs> that was a new thing. Because um, you could get text messages to go through, but you could not make a phone call for days after Katrina. Like, it wasn't happening. Um, and, but so I think like even the infrastructure around that has, has improved because I mean, you know, we just, we never had problems with that in Houston for sure. And I mean, we didn't hear any, any complaints about it though during the, the August flooding in 2016 in Baton Rouge, um, AT&T very famously went down and just was completely incapable of, of functioning and, um, which what's been you know from a business perspective interesting to watch Verizon sort of like they still have billboards and they're like we always have your back Baton Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very, very smart, smart advertising, advertising but. <laughs> indeed, indeed. There's always opportunities, always opportunities. Yeah. Indeed. So so one of the things that <clears throat> tends to happen, especially from folks watching from afar, that aren't in the immediate uh, disaster zone, is when these things unfold. It becomes almost like uh, you know news theater, and, and, and people get hooked on the the twenty four hourness of it and everything, and, and they're falling, falling. And so then, while the disaster is is happening, or even before it actually happens, as it's getting ready to unfold, um, critiques start to roll in. And so, in the case of oh, yes. in the case of Houston, the critique was, um, oh, the you know the the leadership should have. Um, whether it was the county or the city or whatever the the unit we're talking about is, uh, they should have uh, had mandatory evacuations and gotten folks out of there. Um, and and the truth is, uh, to do that safely, they needed more like you know seventy six hours or or what have you. And 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 Harvey, uh, the 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 path of Harvey I should say uh, wasn't really known until um, a much shorter time window than that. But nevertheless, right. that that was the first big one, and then others have have come in. Some of those critiques are totally valid, and, and they're important conversations to have. But some of them seem to be, um, you know, in this age of social media, uh, amplified that maybe don't necessarily have a basis. So, so did you see a lot of people when you in your visit were were they really angry about the the their leadership? Were they really content with how things were? I mean, not not content's not the right word, but but were they, you know, was there a sense of, of anger at the management of, of the overall thing? Honestly, I think that the, the, the most, I guess, pointed conversations that we had in that direction were um, with people from underprivileged neighborhoods. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases not underprivileged, but just minority neighborhoods where they felt that they, they that resources were sent to, to more affluent or... Right more white neighborhoods before they were sent there in order to be saved or to be rescued or whatever, you know, the case may have been, um, you know, and I think I, I, I I don't know what the truth of that situation was. I don't, you know, I just don't know how those plans all came together. Um, but I mean, that is absolutely a conversation that I think is a fair and valid one to have, but for the most part, um, those were the only complaints I heard. It was not, it wasn't, oh, we should have evacuated. It wasn't, you know, um, the shelter isn't, you know, functioning correctly or I didn't know where to go or anything like that. It was it was a question of, um, you know, once the water came in, did I get out when I was supposed to get out or did I get out because everybody else was done being saved? Right, 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 right. What about, and, and that's, that's always, I'm not saying that we shouldn't address these issues, but but the sort of more disenfranchised folks of society are always going to be the ones that are most heavily impacted by an earthquake, by right. flooding or whatever. So, 
but but there clearly is more we can a lot more we can do I think to to be more equitable in how we plan for these things. But but I mean like a great example is I think Houston more so than um, many of our large cities. Uh, even L.A. is starting to get some vague sense of mass transportation. But but you know when we talk about the recovery of these things, some of the things that go down first and, and or some of the last to come back are some of the public transportation systems. And for the mm-hmm. affluent communities, right, that's that's not as big a deal because most affluent folks tend to have their own cars and their own ability to move around, whereas folks lower on our socioeconomic spectrum, they tend to need the buses, need the trains to get to work and, and this and that. Well, I think it's also a communication thing. Like if you are in a lower income area, you may have less access to the internet, which means you have less access to to tell somebody, hey, I do need help. I do That's need right. saving. That's right. That's right. So what were, so when you're traveling around, what were some, I'm always curious uh, as, as to some of the most common phrases that you heard people talking about. Like were, were, were there terms they used a lot or were there sentiments that they, you saw sort of commonly expressed? Um, I mean, if I never hear hunker down again, I'll be fine. But, <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think Katrina had more of those and just because, you know, we were listening to like, there was just, there's less media. And so you, you were in slightly less of an echo chamber with that. Um, but honestly, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really hear very many besides like the, uh, you know, the typical, like, we're thankful, like, at least I have my family kind of thing. Right. Houston strong, you know, blank strong right. and all and the, the typical ones. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Right, right, right. It, it's also great. I mean, not great. That That's, that's a offensive term, I guess, in this context, but, but it's, it, it is, um, reassuring, maybe is the way to say it, that in the, in these times of disaster, usually the vast majority of folks pull together and people are, yeah. are courteous to one another and, and, and extending a helping hand and all this and that. And one, one of the common things you hear in a lot of the reports in the wake of these disasters is, oh man, I wish we could always, I wish we could always behave. It's like Christmas, right? <laughs> like, wish, wish Christmas could be all, all uh, days of the year, you know, kind of thing yeah. like, with everybody getting yeah. along and stuff. So what is your take on, um, I know you were just there for a little bit and, and the stuff is still, uh, things are still drying out and this and that. But what's your take? Are you thinking that Houston, even though we know all these things are always multi-years in terms of their recovery arc, um, but do you think um, Houston is going to be back on its feet pretty quickly? Do you think Houston yeah. is going to be yeah. okay? I mean, the the reason I feel that way is because like there was just this like very weird moment where um, the photographer who came with me, Brett and I, were driving, you know. I think the thing that um, does not did not super translate well to the media, um, you know, representations of the situation, just because it doesn't really make sense to show. Um, I mean, the entire city wasn't underwater, right? It was right, right. It was like specific parts of the city, and the thing is, is Houston is just this massive place, and so, and, you know, even if you have thirty percent of the city underwater, and I'm just pulling that number out of my head, like that's still probably a larger area than New Orleans. So, I mean, you can get across in bad traffic, you can get across New Orleans in 30 minutes. Um, in good traffic, you can get to a different neighborhood in Houston in 30 minutes. Right, right. So, so I mean, we're driving around like we 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 went into Houston with like, you know, our gas cans like hooked to the back and food for food for several days and water for several days and prepared to sleep in the car. I mean, we just drove up to a hotel the first night and like we're able to find a place to sleep. And we were able to get gas the whole time, and there were nail salons open. And <laughs> one night, one night we got a, got margaritas and fajitas at a Mexican <laughs> restaurant. And it's just like, I mean, I was just like looking at Brett. I was like, can you imagine sitting down at a restaurant three nights after Katrina in New Orleans and literally getting any meal at all? <laughs> <laughs> MREs and, maybe, you know, right? Right. And and Brett had actually Brett Brett's a little older than me. He he had actually worked Katrina like for the time speaking and he was there at the time. And he was just like, absolutely not. Like he has one meal that he remembers, you know, because he like he happened to meet somebody who was staying at some fancy hotel downtown and the fancy hotel restaurant was like cleaning everything out. And so like they all had steak and that was like, you know, two nights after Katrina, they all had steak and like that to him is like the meal he had after right. Katrina. 
And I mean, we had like five meals like that <laughs> right, right. in the time we were there for Harvey. So, I mean, do I think Houston's going to bounce back quickly? Yeah, because there's there's still a lot of that city that is like untouched and, and available for business. And um, the other thing of that, too, is frankly, Houston is a more affluent city than New Orleans was. And and I do think also, you know, that that our federal government has learned at least some from those mistakes in Katrina. I mean, one of the shelters um, already had FEMA representatives like standing there, like taking people by day three after the storm um, to start like figuring out claims processes. And, and for better or worse, Houston is a major oil town and, and America needs that city to function. Um, I mean, there's no one sitting around asking, asking Houston, like, it's, you know, why, why would you possibly live in Houston? <laughs> should we rebuild Houston? <laughs> right. Like, should we rebuild Houston? Whereas like New Orleans was like, I mean, still people are asking like, yeah, but you live in New Orleans. So, I mean, you kind of deserved your car to get flooded twice right. a month. <laughs> right, right, right. And then I guess the, the last big question here is, I, I know, I know this can be a hot button thing in, in, in certain places, but so um, one of the things we talk about in our class and with our students in our program is, is this notion of um, how do we make our our, our coastlines more resilient. So how do we? Um, uh, yes, the R word. How do how do we take <laughs> this thing that that was at a certain level and then make it better? This is the age old question. Do you invest in you know whatever it is, raising your house or fixing the levees now when it's a nice sunny day, and and get them you know put that money in to avoid the having to spend four, five, six, ten times more money in the wake of it uh, in the wake of a disaster. To, to rebuild those homes that were then, then destroyed because you weren't able to resist the flooding or the winds or whatever it is. So did you, it, it, it probably was too raw, too, too new, but did you get any sense of, were people talking about things like increasing storm frequency? Were people talking about, um, you know, the built infrastructure at all or anything like that when you were in Houston? Um. I mean, honestly, it just, it was too soon. Like you didn't right. have anybody yet like asking, like they sort of are now like, you know, about, about how we keep punting the NFIP problem down the road. Uh, right. Um, and Which is the national like, flood was, insurance uh, policy or program. Yeah. Program. Yeah. I mean, we just don't like that just wasn't there yet. Um, I think now that we've got Irma headed to Florida and I mean, you know, the FEMA emergency fund was like. I think as of like Thursday was like possibly going to run out by Friday. Um, you know, it, like there, there are definitely those questions. And, and I think since Katrina, those things have been an embedded part of our lives here in new Orleans where, you know, especially with the drainage problems, um, you know, we have, we have a mayor who keeps saying that, you know, our, our, or the city officials, all of them really saying that like our city is built for a cat three hurricane. And it's like, <laughs> not really, like not really, that's not it's really not. the case. Um, That'd be great if it was, but, um, and, and the thing, frankly, now that especially like, as we've seen in the last two years, really in, in this region, that coastal areas have got to be prepared for torrential rain on a regular storm. And they're not, um, you know, especially in new Orleans, we've seen that in the last couple of months, I have a brand new car to thank for it. (laughs) Um, all of central Louisiana last August saw that where it's just, you can have a really bad rainstorm that sits on top of you and you're going to get screwed. Yep. Um, and so so it's, it's it's definitely definitely part of the conversation here. And, and I'm, I'm very very curious curious to see how it becomes becomes a part of the conversation in a, in in a conservative conservative place like Houston. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that, that has been, um, at least those in my ilk have been have been uh, uh, talking about is the fact that uh, President Trump revoked previously yeah. existing executive order to you know when we do infrastructure rebuilding in the wake of disaster that we bring them up to a more resilient level than they were and and a lot of uh, then that that was put in place by the Obama administration and the critique for that was oh they, they mentioned climate change in there and that's why. And, and if the Obama folks had not put in climate change and just said, in general, make it more resilient, maybe people wouldn't be ticked off about it. And, and it is disappointing, I guess, as an academic, but also disappointing as, as I just say, an American, that what you have something that, that could be saving money, saving lives, saving infrastructure, you know, a policy, and to revoke it based on sort of politics or, or, or different views of certain folks seems to be uh, very unfortunate, if not irresponsible. But we'll yeah, see how I'm, that changes. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see when... It's just it's it's a it's a bizarre thing to me that that we're willing to listen to to to, to science when you know we 
want to know exactly what time the moon's going to cover the sun exactly. or exactly where this hurricane's going to go. But as soon as the news becomes inconvenient, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's like, Oh, well, I don't know. Like, sounds like a part yeah. of an agenda. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, you know, like, cool. But Harvey was a problem and we've got Irma and Jose <laughs> and, and Katya, like all hanging out at one time pretty much. So, you know, just a thought, maybe pay attention. But... Just a thought, just a thought. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, this has been great, Chelsea. Thank, thanks so much for doing this. Is there, are there any other things that you think that uh, you'd like folks to to take away from either Harvey or the most recent storms that maybe they're not getting from afar or not not seeing from afar? I think we pretty much covered it. Um, you know, I think especially like like what, what we talked about with with how Houston was not like the entire city of Houston wasn't underwater was was pretty just pretty weird to me. To you know, like I said, like there were, like that there were nail salons open. All right, like, all right, right. like. <laughs> So we'll see. I think I, I do think it's going to be really interesting to watch how how conversations around climate change um, maybe maybe shift in in that part of Texas um, in you know next election cycles or whatnot. But uh, but all to be determined. All right, epic. Uh, well, super cool. Thanks again for taking time out of your day, Chelsea, for talking to us. Say hi to the family, <laughs> and uh-huh. and everybody should go read your your columns now, not not your articles or your posts or your whatever, but. Everybody should follow you on Twitter, and everybody should uh, go read your columns on NOLA.com. Not not time speaking, but NOLA.com. Awesome. <laughs> That's it. All Thank right, cool. you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Charles. Bye. Okay, bye.